let's see here. Ooh, cool guys. What's up? Okay, let's go. Let's go and see. Let's rank everyone's appearance in chat. Okay, the very first person in today was Jess. Number one, Vectric. Number two, oh, Misha. Number three, he got it first one time. He's been hanging around for ever since day one. I think he was on the very first stream, and I think he got first once, which was yesterday, I believe. I believe, and he had notice ahead of time which some of you guys didn't christopher oh let's see after misha was oh man famerson i'll say that i'm bad pronunciation christopher comes in at five who else who else do we have sanders at six bacon at seven and that's it so we got you guys sounding in i got my haunted mansion cup from disneyland and it is cold i'm wearing my jacket i'm wearing my jacket i think it was 22 degrees fahrenheit in at my house in my house too probably um in celsius that is below zero that's all i know because 32 degrees is zero. Okay, so what my th thought was today, and this is what we did on Discord, was we put up, uh, Jeff put up a document for you guys to ask questions on, and it was a freaking great idea. Basically, in Discord, hit that link, and then you can ask a question, and then that question stays on screen, and I can read it, right? It also, you'll see it on the right here, on your screen there's a summary um, there's responses who uh, I think these are our participants so far look locations that's pretty cool and categories which is cool so general art questions so it's kind of like uh, information based um, Q&A which is interesting to me I think those stats are uh, very important like get at uh, at my current job everything is derived from stats you can't just fake something you actually have to have the stats so to me it's cool that we're starting to think that way on the stream so let's get down to it also I will have the discord open somewhere if you want to ask a question but I kind of feel like um, that one might fall to the side so we're going here first where and how does one learn basics of concept art other than skill what else does it take to become a concept artist and what goals can a, con a new concept artist look to achieve in order to get closer to being hired Ooh, that's a that's like that's like the <laughs> that's like the biggest question there is which is how do you concept art um so let's break this apart. Where and how does one learn the basics of concept art? I I feel like, you know, a lot of, we have people from all over the place and we've talked about this. You can either go get an education if you're thoroughly convinced that concept art is for you 100%, definitely go get a and you can afford it, go get the best education you can get. That's kind of tough for some people if you, because you guys are around the world, not necessarily everyone has access to uh, a great design school within a few hundred or thousand miles, and sometimes it's outside of your budget. And at that point, you have to find tutorials and you have to look online. And basically, if you're here, I kind of feel like you're being part of a community that has the same goal as you. So you guys should be sharing the best tutorials. You should be helping each other out. And then at that point, you'll get better at drawing and hopefully very skilled at drawing. And then hopefully an opportunity will break open for you. And I, I know it's super easy to say, and I kind of like glossing a little bit because I think this is pretty much our topic on every stream. Um, 
hot coffee yes but i've seen it we've seen it in the discord that um well misha's a good example like when he first started he was just learn not learning to draw he knew how to draw very well but he was working on his concept art skill sets didn't really have all the vocabulary down yet and he got one little job to start and then now he's like a little busy freelancer you know he's still he's still working towards that starting his own studio goal which i think most people have um and when i say starting your own studio i i think like either being full-time freelance or full times in a studio somewhere or starting your actual studio and hiring people but and he's kind of turned it from uh a situation that this person is in where you don't you don't really have a ton of opportunity and if you if you think Misha is a fancy lad he is as easygoing well okay I won't say easygoing because he I think he's wound up pretty tight on some things <laughs> uh, he could definitely be intense but he is salt of the earth guy I don't I don't see he doesn't put on Instagram pictures of him in a fancy BMW throwing cash out the window. You know, he works hard during the day to create an opportunity that allows him to do more art during the evening. That guy works hard. So if you're not prepared to like get into that mode where you're working very hard on the education, then, you know, that would be a red flag to me to show to you to say, man, it's so cool. My nose is running. Sorry. Um, that you know you you have to definitely get into that mindset if you want to be successful as a concept artist so what goals can a new concept artist look to achieve in order to get closer to being hired i would i would you know that's um let's see i would say find a niche find something that you do really well i don't think most concept artists are when they're starting out are good at a lot of things certainly I wasn't the one thing I had a knack for when I was starting out was um, painting or drawing lighting so my very very first job was uh, drawing lighting illustrations for a company that designed light fixtures for hospital and so it's kind of a we you know you wouldn't even think that's an opportunity but these guys basically had a new light fixture and they wanted to show the clients like you know the idea of their light fixture and so I went in and just basically drew the light shape that would land on a wall in a hospital room it was kind of cool uh, but what I did was I leveraged that one skill set that was spiking higher than the rest of my skill set so the things that I didn't have at that time was anatomy um, I didn't have complex uh, environment scenes yet and I didn't have matte painting yet and so that one little opportunity branched into two opportunities and as I was hitting that one thing I was able to get in more education and then get better at other skill sets so what that means is as you're going through and learning concept art, there might be something that you have a knack for. Maybe it's uh, graphics, maybe it's typography, maybe it's um, maybe you're great at drawing faces, maybe you're great at drawing perspective or cubes. Let's draw a cube. Uh, so when you're good at that one item, that's the thing I feel like you should go seek out and see who needs it and then get a job, get your very first little tiny gig doing that. Um, and once you have that little tiny gig done, you should, you should do it excellent, the best of your ability. I mean, you're gonna lose a ton of money. It's not, uh, freelancing is a whole nother skill set. Being able to um, concentrate, to do your work, also to estimate your timeline. So in the beginning, when you're getting your first job and then you accidentally, um, you'd accidentally think it's going to take four hours, but it ends up taking three days. That's your fault. That's not the client's fault. So just 
use it as an education that very first stuff the reason i don't want you to make it the client's fault if it takes too long so you don't go to them and say hey i need more money is that you want them to hire you again if they feel like that you were missing on some of the information or you didn't do it on time or it cost more than they thought then they're not going to hire you you have to get them to hire you for the second job and then in the second job you kind of understand like oh okay shoot i underestimated by three hours i'm going to have to say it's going to take two days instead and at that point then you start working into a good freelance rhythm which is a skill in itself so that's that's kind of like how to get your first job and then how to parlay it those connections on those very first jobs are like the most important thing in your life the um the education yes but you have spent three years or a year or four years or however long your whole life building up to that one moment so even though your education is as a is very important that one moment becomes the result of your whole entire education so i could argue that pound for pound that moment in your life is the most important moment is parlaying that first job into your second job and i could think of i could think of times when i screwed up on those moments uh i'll give you an example and uh I'll preface this with no, no no other concept artist that I know. Hey, thanks for the subscribe. Uh, sorry, I didn't show up on the thingy. Um, but I'll preface this with the um, the fact that not many concept artists share this type of information. So yeah, I'm trying to keep it real for you guys. But I had an opportunity to uh, work with a production artist. Uh, production designer on a film and this guy was super good well known and so i worked with him and i did storyboards and they were pretty good um and and they would notice i say pretty good i wasn't fully vested yet in my skill set so they're okay but they they were for commercials so for him they exceeded the job well as a as kind of like a man i like this guy he shared my contact information and got me appointment an appointment with the storyboard artist from jurassic park on the set of i think it was on universal set so i drove i got to drive in i had a pass i brought i brought my work um and i'm trying to remember the guy's name and i went into the studio i went to his desk and we got, we got to chat for 40 minutes or something like that and it was super cool it was a learning experience for me and he you know i showed him my work i'm like here's my storyboard you know and and he was like yeah those are pretty cool well this guy was the very this guy was maybe the top three or four storyboard artists in all of the industry so when he looked at my work, he basically was like, oh, God, this, this kid, he's, you know, uh, my storyboards were so bad compared to his storyboards. And I'm not saying like the look of them were bad, but now that I look back, the, the camera movements and the things, I didn't really have the proficiency to understand all the bits in a storyboard camera movement dialogue how the shots work out how, like i kind of faked it uh because i was new out of school and we had one storyboard class we didn't have film theory in my department so i didn't quite have it all learned so when i showed that guy that basically the the guy said hey that's that's cool you know it's nice to meet you and and he helped me out but you notice that i say he helped me out i wasn't able at that point to help him out so i was so i thought oh was it dave archer it might be um so i was out of my league and it wasn't it wasn't my fault the other guy really liked my work but dave i think it was dave um he was the best in the industry and so you show your portfolio and you jump super high you better do something to make sure that you make that impression when you get that chance obviously i didn't make the impression and i didn't get the storyboard job uh, but the thing was i had that moment shot fresh out of school 
on Jurassic story, Jurassic Park storyboards. Um, and had I had the experience, like I'm trying to share with you guys right now, I would have read the books <laughs> on storyboarding, and I would have caught, I would have researched him, and I would have looked at his style of storyboards, and I would have matched some of his work with my style and and when i say match the technical proficiency i wouldn't have just drawn squares you know of a storyboard i would have looked at his camera movements his arrows the way he paces his shots and then i would have done a similar thing but my own way at least and even like how you name storyboards and how you title them and how you write around them you can look like not a professional in two seconds so that's what happened and i don't know if i'm super sad about that because if i got into storyboards that early in my career i think i might have missed some of my concept you know it wasn't exactly in my lane um and what i really do enjoy is concepting environments concepting uh just problem solving and storyboards are problem solvings, but with a very specific set of skills. Um, so for my lesson to you is that's, that is the discussion of fostering that very first moment. So there's one case with the lighting company where I did do great. And then I ended up parlaying that into an actual, um, that connection turned into a job at universal or sorry, six flags, magic mountain. And I was able to do some rides over there fresh out of school, but I didn't parlay my storyboard connection into more storyboard jobs. So right there was a huge split in my career. And I didn't even, I wasn't even quite aware of it at the time that pushed me towards environment work and lighting, which I currently do now, instead of going into film and storyboards and shots and probably cinematography and some visual effects um so for you guys make sure you take care of those very specific moments or at least have the ability to spot those moments so i think i think that's a very <laughs> that might be a long-winded answer to that first question but i feel like i feel like those were good stories okay so let's move on to the next question um how do you know if you're calling is environment or character art? Oh, see, there we go. Uh, since I was little, I was always creating little different worlds and comics for Pokemon, etc., as a hobby. And when I used to do that, um, which was like third grade, I guess, I focused mainly on just creating characters and creatures. Now that I'm an adult and have chosen to be a concept artist, I had to choose either characters or environments, and I choose environments. Oh, yes, right? I feel like I would be naturally better at character and creature art, but I chose environments because it was something I knew nothing about and it would be awesome to know how to do it. Should I follow my nature or just stick it through and keep working towards being an environmental concept artist? Okay, let's see this. Um, I am a, I'm definitely an environment concept guy and I know a lot of my friends are purely character concept guys in the industry. Let's see. Um, I think there's more esteem. Well, let's not say esteem. There's more being a character artist is more player forward. And what player forward means is the player, uh, the audience deals with your piece, uh, more often than other pieces. So let's say you des you designed uh, the new um, Assassin's Creed character. They'll, the, so many people will see that and you'll become potentially a fairly notable concept artist and you will get a lot of um, accolades. Now an environment artist, there are a lot more environments in a game than there are characters. It, you can't argue like, Yes, there's there's mobs and, and so many creatures and whatnot. There are a ton of characters, um, but for just the mileage 
of environments in in games you know in a 50 hour game or something or an mmo there's just there's just this huge world and for me personally i love even though it's not as player forward you don't really see accolades for man this rock looks so amazing like i can't believe who designed this rock or this bush or tree or leaf or whatever but i have to say when i was playing destiny 2 and i got to the world that was kind of like the digital environment that was also rock and had foliage on it so it's very angular and very cube like and spherical but they did it in a way that was so amazing with these te the textures and the way it corrodes but it leaves these digital roots everywhere or, or very um uh, bilinear almost algorithmic feel or fractal feel under the surface of the rocks i i was so amazed i like that environment way better than i like any of the characters the characters i felt like yeah okay this is kind of like a potentially derivative in nature yeah it's guys in armors with guns yeah, i mean that's cool I, I love it i like to draw it too you know it's fun but man that like a totally unique idea like that uh, like those environments really is amazing to me but you won't see any awards for it the other thing is if you're thinking about the production just production in itself uh, there's a lot more work to do in environments and environments I would say what's up Justin how's it going <laughs> uh, environments I would say you're also thinking about all the chests all the crates all the pieces doorways hallways those are all individual elements that got to get designed so if you're looking for a if you want to have a broader scope when you do try to find a job uh, environment is not a bad way to go because you have all these individual props and elements that need to be designed uh, so if even if you're not really great at environments you're not you can't do a compound environment with a tons of layers and a lot of perspective but you still can draw you know we all practice cubes and there's always a crate or a shipping container or something to design in an environment you can start at those relatively easier objects and look very good versus trying to take on a deer. You know, I say like an animal, like a deer, because a deer is hard to draw, very hard to draw correctly compared to a cube or a crate or a garbage can or something like that. Much less trying to draw an eight armed uh, arachnid warrior from outer space or something like that. Um, so I think the entry level on environment is a little more forgiving. I think competition and character art is a little higher. I think there's more work in environment art. Um, but the accolades and kind of like the, if, if you're someone who really likes being player for, uh, player focused or player forward art, or you want some accolades or you're really driven by seeing your character run around or you're also an animator then you know you definitely could lean to character stuff but for here for you guys i always say well i want you to do the best drawing you can do so just know that that means don't jump into characters because if you don't know anatomy if you don't know um how skeletal structures work if you don't know how to make it look convincing unless it's very specifically not supposed to look convincing then I would say you you know have fun but environment I think there's a little more flexibility so for for you and I'm, your name's not here but I would say if you have an I would say point towards your aptitude but be realistic as to what your aptitude is if your characters if you're starting out and you feel like your characters are you know a little your faces are a little wonky or you haven't spent time in figure drawing class to really nail down anatomy then it would be a long road to get into concept art 
trying to do it that way. And honestly, it, I mean, they're like complete different expertise, expertises, expertise. Okay. So they're different, totally different skill sets because characters you have, not only do you design them, you have to be able to pose them. You have to be able to have expressions. You have to be able to tell a story with them and tell a narrative with them. They can't, it's not just like they stand there, but you have to have them with a cup of coffee and it has to be hot and their face has to be, you know, make a face that makes sense. Uh, where environments, uh, you have a little more, I want some depth. I want some grandeur. I, I want convincing lighting and perspective. I want to set a mood and, but the environment stays fairly static, depending, um, if it's a rigid environment, like a city, the lighting will change, but you don't have a whole new expression or a facial expression or a style of walk or an injured state that you would in a character. Although injured state in a city would be apocalypse, which I love doing too. So, so that's my quick, quick ish answer to that. Uh, so there's really, you just have to look inside yourself and say, which, which thing can you do eight hours a day and have fun? So whatever you have fun the most, I think that's what will carry you to be inspired to do the work, which will make your work better which will make you more hireable. Yeah, definitely more hireable. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Man, these are kind of fun. We should do all my YouTube comments because <laughs> logically speaking, there are finite characters in game from Justin. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could. And also the one thing about characters and you know, I think we have a whole nother stream on AI um, AI driven content or AI propagated content. So imagine you basically design a sweater, shoes, pants, and a hat. And then AI knows there's five different body types and they basically pick from this closet that you've drawn and then basically build up 500 different characters for a game. So I, and that's true on, I, that's a whole different stream, but that's also true in a city, right? I don't think, I think now you guys need to be paying attention to, um, algorithmically created content. So it's good to be a concept artist where you're the person trying to drive the algorithm and being the person trying to do derivatives of that original concept i do feel like there's uh a, a future in which a lot of that is automated i don't know if that's 10 years 20 years 50 years but that is in the future okay um rob can you tell a bit about your work experience in disney ea activision and what you did there and what you learned from taking uh, and then taking those into the, your future. Okay, so Disney, I worked, um, Disney was a internship. Well, it wasn't even an internship, maybe a workshop. But it was, it was that ride in the, okay, what was it? It was called Rocket Rods. And it's in the future world of Disneyland. And the rocket rods was a replacement of people movers and they brought a few students in for a few days to work on rocket rods well I, my good story on that though is i was drawing i was drawing pretty good but there's this and there's like five of us and i think we were there for a few days um and there's this one guy that kept drawing such good stuff and i was kind of getting like i'm a competitive artist i i can't hide it if someone draws really good, I try to step my game up. It's not because I don't like them. It's just that I'm inspired by someone that draws better. So I try to step my game up. This guy was drawing these fantastic pictures and I was like trying to keep up, trying to keep up. And the, uh, the staff at Imagineering were like, man, this guy's pretty good. And I could see that they were drawn to his drawings. And I, I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm kind of screwed. Well, whatever. Uh, I know, right? I'm throwing a little shade. I'm trying, but this one good. Well, then it turns out. So this guy, I work with him at school a few times. He's always pretty good, pretty good showboater. Uh, 
you know, he's all had lots of color, lots of scenery, his explosions in his paintings and whatnot. And pretty good. I don't you know. I'm not going to lie. The guy's substantially better than my skill set. Well, that guy right now, his name's Ryan Church. <laughs> so, and I'm sure you guys all know who Ryan Church is. Yeah, now he's on Star Wars and doing everything very cool and has and has uh dvds and a bunch of stuff and i he might be retired by now but he honestly is one of the best artists i know and and he was a little bit a year behind me when we went into that workshop and i didn't you know i had had this the first time i met him so i was like yeah okay whatever kid uh but uh, he ended up being so damn good and i'm stoked for him and i still aspire to draw as good as him so maybe someday you know i still what do i have i probably have 20 30 years left on my uh on my ride so there's still a chance maybe maybe i'll get star wars 14 or 15 or something we'll see <laughs> But that's what I that's my most Disney memorable memorable moment. I also worked at Disney Compu Consumer Products as a freelancer and drew some toys for them. Uh I think the those drawings were like meh ish. So I didn't I didn't really gain a lot of traction at Disneyland. Um let's see. EA. EA worked several projects, Sims 4, uh most notable. And so from Sims 4 it's also some of the people so the people from sims 4 worked with me and i did some workshops did some really cool i think it was sims 4 sims 4 um and i did a bunch of environments for them they looked really cool and i can't really release them because they're they're still making expansion packs with environments i painted that are unknown yet to the consumer i think i just don't want to like break into that problem and it doesn't i don't really need to show those yet so you know, in 10 years, maybe I'll show them. But here's where the parlay happens. Because I was a freelancer on Sims 4, and then I did a little workshop, and I showed guys, like, I, you know, how to draw, like I drew, which, you know, it's not for everyone, but for me it works. Um, and it turned out that those guys, and that was years ago, ended up at Riot and then thought of me to bring me on at Riot. So that's how that parlay, even though it could be delayed by three or four years, when those people hit a problem that is hard to solve in their next companies down the line, potentially they think of you if you had solved that problem in the past. So the problem that these guys had was, you know, something that I could help out on. So I was super stoked about EA. Activision, Activision was super, I think that was my first game company that I worked at um, out of art school. And I worked with another freaking guy that was hard to draw with because <laughs> he was good. Uh, and his name was James Klein, one of my good buddies. But I also, I, I, was, but I was buddies with James all through school. And so um, it was cool. I, I, he hooked me up at Activision, and then now I think he's uh, he's a supervisor, effects supervisor, or an art director on Star Wars right now. So that's cool. Ryan and James both are on Star Wars, so good for them. Um, I'm not envious at all. I mean, who would want to? Who would want Who possibly would want to draw new Tie Fighters and X-wing stuff? Or stormtroopers who, or robots, or explosion, who possibly. So guys, if you ever see my stream, call me. Just kidding. Actually, I do love, uh, I love what I do. It's in my lane. That's another thing, is know your, kind of know your lane. Those guys, their styles are way different than mine. Uh, and my style is definitely super appropriate for Riot. And I love Riot. But I am jealous that I don't get to draw the next Darth Vader or Stormtrooper or gun or spaceship. Man, I really do want to draw a spaceship someday. Okay, next question. Is there a better chance to get an internship position in companies by telling them I don't need to be paid because I want to learn and get experience in a company environment? Uh, 
I don't I'm torn, dude. I'm torn. I think that I think getting paid Okay, so here's my thought. And I've used it this I've used this my whole time. I I won't work for free at all. Unless it's like family bugging me or something. So or it's a trade out. So you know, there's there's people like locally. I need a logo or something. I'll I'll, I'll help them. Maybe it's for free if it's like a, a really good friend of mine. I'll help them. But if it's industry, even I would say, I even have said like I won't work for free, but you can pay me whatever you want. And so, basically, what the message is, is that I'm. I know I'm worth something. If I don't think that I'm worth something, then how are they expected to think I'm worth something? So that's the same thing for you. If you guys don't think you're worth something, then their attitude towards you is going to be skewed because they'll be like, yeah, this guy thinks he's not that great, maybe, or girl. Um, so why should we pay them and someone who wouldn't pay you to get an internship that's a shady person anyway who the hell wouldn't pay you to be an artist even if someone helps me out with my stuff here i offer them something i pay something i try and i don't take anything for well although jeff helps out immensely so i do figure i owe him because he put this document together um so my attitude is you don't necessarily have to make a ton like I've done things where I say, yeah, pay me a dollar, pay me $18, pay, pay me $40. And I said, uh, with the caveat that you know you're getting $2,000 worth of free work, but I, but, and I want you to tell, if you ever tell anyone else like how much it costs to get this painting done, it's a $2,000 painting. I'm just doing it because I'm, I really want to do that painting. It's worth it for me just to learn or something or I like let's say let's say uh, they I got a job on the next Star Wars and they said hey we need a new Tie Fighter would I do that for free hell yeah I would do that for free everyone in here would do that for free but I can't let them think that I don't think I'm not worth it so I would tell them you know I know us I know it's worth something so I will charge you ten thousand dollars with the nine hundred and ninety nine dollar discount wait nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollar discount and then you tell the next guy when you do hire me for the next one then my rate is still the same rate that's the other thing that you kind of got to be careful about is if you go in as an intern super low and they do want to hire you then they're going to want to give you like a little bump up from where you were hired so if you get in at like ten dollars an hour or ten kronen an hour uh then they'll say oh we'll give you 12 for uh when you're working full time and then that's that's burns my ass too and i don't think that's right so as an intern make it clear like hey i really want to make whatever amount of an hour if i get full time i would expect that uh you know i would get a good bump but i understand that i'm learning so you know i don't have to take a bunch of money but i definitely think that i'm worth something and not worth for free worth working for free and you know you can negotiate that on your for your own feelings but from the people that i met online in the discord I kind of feel like, you know, someone will put up a painting and say, hey, I did this painting and, you know, I'm charging $40. And I can look at a painting and go, like, God damn, that thing's a $400 painting and they just sold it for $40. And that's true. I think any any sketch, I mean, sketches and digital paintings and stuff, you know, to me, I think the range, um, I don't think I've ever sold, like, sold one less than a hundred dollars and then uh and then my top ones are just they go like way over the top so if you're if you're even dipping in when it, they're a hundred like let's say a hundred dollar sketch that's a sketch that i'm doing i eight of a day or something you know so um or you know four four to eight a day so in your when you're thinking about yourself, think of it that way. 
uh, you know, and I want you guys to have, I think if you start out not thinking that you're a valuable asset to a company, I think that's a bad position to be on. Um, my attitude is going with the company as a valuable asset, like, Hey, I can really help you out. Um, and then they'll say, well, we don't know, like we haven't seen your track record. We don't know how you, how hard you work. So we'll pay you lower. And I say, no, I said, no, the answer to that, if they say like, we don't know if you work out, then I just say, oh, well then you just get rid of me. You would fire me. That's what you do. I absolutely happy if things don't work out and you get rid of me, but just let me get in, do my one or two paintings at my rate. You can't possibly, they can't possibly know how valuable it is. If you solve the mo world's most complex problem in one drawing, that painting is worth a fortune, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not lying. Um, or you can draw for a month and do zero paintings that they can actually use in production. And then basically you could have a hundred of them and those would be worth absolutely nothing because they didn't, they didn't help push production forward. So they have no idea of knowing that until they actually work with you. So you just say, Hey, my paintings are worth whatever, or my time is worth whatever. And if, if it doesn't work out, don't pay me and I'll leave or they should pay you. Uh, you just say, if it doesn't work out, then you fire me and that's it. But nine times out of 10, well, actually a hundred times out of a hundred, I've never been fired. And I've always basically been able to parlay that statement into more work. So that's what I would recommend for you guys. Um, I think that kind of the most important thing is if someone's going to hire you for nothing, they're not a serious studio. No real studio would do that. That's just some guy trying to take advantage or uh, some guy or girl trying to take advantage of people who are desperately looking for work online. So don't work for a company that would do that. In my, op in my opinion, IMO. Hi Rob. I live, I live in Germany at the moment. Should I move to the US after I graduate? I plan on maybe going to art school here. It is more or less free, but I don't know if there are gonna be many jobs in the city I live. Uh, I know there's a dye studio here, but that's about it. Uh, okay, so Germany, there's a super cool studio. It's uh, six more vodka, six more vodka. Uh, they are some of the most talented people I know. And actually they're, uh, in California right now, a substantial portion of their studio visiting my studio. Uh, so there are some really good studios in Germany and the people from six more vodka are from all over the world. So that would be the first place I would shoot for, for an internship if you could, um, but I would definitely get a hold of that free education before I came to the the states. And your 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 parlay might be get your good at, get your base education in Germany that's very cost effective. Get really good at being an artist, and then maybe touching up in the states with some workshops or something. Like spend a summer here and check out some of that stuff. Make some network friends, and then going back to Germany if that's where you want to live. Uh, I would say that globalization of concept art is becoming easier. It's not quite perfect. And you do have to have a, um, you do have to have some serious connections to make it work. And I've been working globally for seven years now, so it's a hundred percent possible, but I do have a fairly huge a fairly massive network underneath that that supports it so my advice to you is either is find a moment to get a network um what you know and you could do it through discord through our discord uh or you could do it um on your own uh, but definitely travel a little bit and maybe go to some of the shows gdc maybe gdc i don't know maybe there's some events that would be cool to go to la but i would definitely try to spend a summer in LA or a year in LA once you get your skill set just to meet people. I, I don't know if you would necessarily 
think of it as a, but yeah, basically a year long job interview and then see if you could set yourself up remotely. That's what I would do. Okay. Uh, next question. What are the top things to look for when building your own world? I'm currently building a whimsical adventure book for my girlfriend and I want to make sure that everything fits together. Ooh. Man, that's a tough one. I would say how I approach that type of thing is I put together a mood board. Um, they're also called trend boards. They're also called trim boards. Um, but basically collect reference. I would collect reference on my world to get an idea of the type of world. And I basically try to get a big picture of the whole thing. So I would write a story about it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fully drawn out story with characters and everything, but you should have like um, a chart that says like the main area, the capital, the people, the the bad area, the nice area, the this character's here, that character's there, almost like a road map. Uh, and then that would give you this big broad picture of what it is. Then I would get some reference and collect like what are some of the imagery or some of the potential imagery of the world. Um, at least the texture and the mood and the lighting and the color schemes. And then I would probably start banging away on it. The thing about a world is it's this, it would take, it would take me, if I was trying to flesh out an entire world, <laughs> it would take me a year. It would take me years. It would probably take me years. I would probably just start with the world map though first, and then I would go from there. So that's a tough job. But that's how I start. And I think Misha's doing, Misha's done like world building type stuff. Um, so you can probably hit him up. He has a super rapid uh, development cycle. You can hit him up for fun if you haven't already. Uh, um, unless that was Misha writing that question. Then you should talk to yourself because I think you're doing a great job anyway. I love it. Actually, I love Misha. I keep talking about Misha. Sorry, but I do follow him on Instagram <laughs> and there he did an old man with a beard. I freaking love that painting. Dude, that's a good one. I love it. Okay. Um, let's see. Ooh, look at this question. Did I miss that one? What is a good and practical way to create mood in an image and still have realistic rendering? Uh, definitely lighting. Definitely. Uh, oh, check out. Oh, what's his scene staging does all your mood so the staging of your scene the drama of your lights are they high do they feel like they're from the sun or do they feel like they're from a single candle in a dark room where you can't see the corners and something could be hiding in the corner uh, so that lighting also the staging if the camera's above your characters then there's a little bit of drama like I'm I'm above this and witnessing it if the cameras at their eye level of the characters then I'm one of the characters and I'm a participant so it's the difference between a witness and a participant um, if the cameras low then the characters can look looming and large and seen so really it's how you and if you have a wide angle camera it will pull in more assets from your environment and give a more detail and more richness, but it might also push your characters back, which will make you feel like you're, um, you're detached from the scene where if you're using a zoom lens, you feel intimate and you, the person's, clo person's close to you or the characters close to you, almost whispering in your ear, even though they, they could be far away, but you're zoomed in. So you have your camera, you have your lighting, you have your staging, and your composition and of course like how and when I say lighting that's basically all encompassing for shadows and color and um, composition a little bit of composition because how you place your characters is a big part of it but I also basically your lighting gives you your dark graphic shapes in your scene and those graphic shapes are the things that will drive your mood uh, there's a bunch of tutorials so I would hit those too on staging and, and painting, painting light for drama. Let's go. Uh, hi, Rob. 
I'm currently studying game art and I'm struggling with putting together a portfolio. I'm just not sure how much of my work progress I should display. I'm really scared about showing flaws, mistakes, and unfinished work will keep me from getting a job. Um, even though professional managers usually, usually want to see personal and artistic development, do you have any advice for portfolios in dealing with these struggles? Dude, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's super tough. So my rule of thumb is when you put your portfolio out there, when you when you are trying to get the contact of someone looking like hey trying to send you a mail or your art station for instance that's when you put your best pieces only don't put up uh you can put up work in progress if they're super cool and you are into them um as and you can put up some of your process images like your sketches your development work as long as they lead to the final piece uh, and the, but the final piece has to be a spot on. You can't have um, any whammies in there. And we were we were talked about this a few times on stream and podcasts that with art directors. And when we did a Q and A in Discord with a couple art directors, it's basically like they'll look at six pieces, and if one of them is a flyer, you know. Uh, and a, a flyer means like it's when you're shooting and you're shooting for bullseyes and you have you have five bullseyes but then one of them's out here so, and that's called a flyer so if you're looking at a portfolio and there's five good ones and a flyer then you're just like ooh, why did they put that in there and then your question is like did they think it was a good piece or do they know it's a bad piece so if they think it's a good piece and it is a bad piece, then that's a problem. And so at that point, you you can you just rule people out because you have 500 other portfolios to look at. So any flyers in your uh, portfolio on the top surface would rule you out. So definitely don't do that. Only put, and I feel safe, like I honestly on sinking the hook, you know, like trying to get that connection. I only feel safe with like five or six of my paintings. And unfortunately, they're ones that everyone's seen already five million times. So it's like, ugh. Um, but in your guys' case, I would put only your favorite stuff. Then what you do, the trick that I have is uh, make that main image, you know, maybe make a sheet of the design itself. So that main image, and then you put your other sketches and work that's like so-so, make them really small in the same thing. So they can see like, hey, here's a cool, hey, look, only if I had Photoshop open, ha ha. Ha ha, let's do this. Instead of waving my damn hands. Okay, so what I've done is I'll have a big piece here that I really like. And then generally the ones that people ask about like on my portfolio is, are some type of city image, right? Um, and then if I have like so-so pieces, I'll put them as little thumbnails on the bottom like this so that you have the Oh, this guy thinks this one's cool. I agree. And then you go, oh, look, these are the, that's how he got there. You know, he started from here and then it went, -da -da. so this, you have to communicate, find a way in your portfolio, a way to communicate that you had a timeline of events where you drew these little crappy ones and then it ended up on your the one you really liked. If you take, if you have a, a one you really like, and then one that's like, eh, and then one that's like, uh, and they're all equally um, displayed in your portfolio, then the art director, he comes in like this, and he goes, yay, and he goes, what? And he goes, next, when he sees your shitty one. So you want to make sure that you establish this kind of like timeline thing. 
And visually, what that means is at a hierarchy, you could either lower the opacity of these, lower the contrast of these, make them smaller. You can, you can, you know, stack them. I don't know, be creative. That's part of your portfolio construction. But that's what I, that's what I totally recommend. Then if, uh, and my story, my story on getting hired at Riot was I showed them, <laughs> so I was ready with all my work. Yay, had my portfolio. I had it down to literally, okay, so here's the thing. I have 50,000 hours of drawing. Um, I kind of figured it out, like I did the math, and it's about 50 something thousand, 55,000 hours of drawing. And I literally have, uh, there are 40 pieces that I kind of like for one reason or, or another. And there's about 12 pieces that I'm like, okay, this one's good. This one, I, this one I'll put forward. And so I put in, I made a portfolio of 30, I made two portfolios, a 12 piecer and a 40 piecer. Um, and then basically I showed, I came in to Riot when I had my interview with all these people. There's three, three, there's a several. Yeah, it was tough, dude. It was a freaking, it was the toughest interview ever. Um, and I pull out my portfolio. I'm like, would you like to see my work? And they're, they, you know what they said? They said, no, we already looked at your website. We already looked at your <laughs> art station. We know that you can do exactly what we want. Now let's figure out who you are as a person. And I was so thrown. It was, it was so, I was so whammied at that point that I just felt, uh, I felt like, oh God, what do they mean? And actually it worked out really well in the end because then I ended up with the job. So that part was good, but, um, just know that if you do put all that weird stuff out there, that someone potentially, if they if they're a big studio with assets, they're gonna search your name and they're gonna see like where you've propagated all your work. So if it's a deviant art, if it's an art station, if it's a whatever. Uh, so what's kind of nice on our Discord is that the history deletes itself. So they're not gonna find that stuff. So if you do put up a working sketch on in the crits. Uh, section that's going to fade away and then you can actually share your work a little bit and not have it propagate forever and ever and haunt you because you drew something terrible when you were uh, 14 and then now that you're uh, 65 uh, it, that sketch is still following you around throughout the world on the web so that's my advice on that if you do feel like you have to share your work, then share it under a pseudonym or something that can't be tracked so much, um, or something that you can delete or something that you shut off eventually before you, um, before you are super serious about trying to get a job. So if you had your main art station, I think there's a couple of people that do this. You have your main art station under your name and then you have, you know, like, Rob Brown's art station. That's, I have my regular name. And then, uh, then potentially I could have one that's like work in progress, you know, and then that's it. And then that one I would shut off. But even still, if they're, you might not even know if they're looking at you as a prospect. Um, that's a lot that happens a lot too, where the studio is browsing through art station knowing that they need a specific style of artist and then they might approach you if they've looked through your art station so you have to be super diligent about curating your art station content to be pointed towards getting a job at all at pretty much all times if if you're serious about trying to get a job and that's where i would say then you post in crit and work in progress on discord for those types of things okay i think that's the end of our questions yay that was fun i hope you guys had fun i had a blast i don't even know I, man that was like so much wow 
we got a lot of freaking viewers right now. I can't believe it. That's super cool. I do appreciate the support, buddies. But you know what that means. Justin already said it. He already said it. You know what that means. That means we're getting some sad music going. Alright, here's where we get our feels on. I want you guys to head out and draw something or experience something today. Right? Um, get some practice in. I know it's hard. Everyone knows it's hard. It's freaking hard for everyone. But if you guys band together, it's not going to be hard for you as a community. So whether you do that here or you do that on Discord or if you do that on Facebook or wherever, 10 years from now, that probably won't be a Discord. Just band together as a community, work with each other and make each other better and put pressure on yourselves. And just know that that sketch is not a slice of your soul. sketch is just a snapshot of what you were capable of mechanically and didn't necessarily capture everything in your head so don't feel bad if it's not perfect yet because someday and i'm not even there yet it will be perfect i still feel like my sketches are like eh, and i only got fifty thousand dollars so for you guys just keep working and enjoy you, know, you can love you can have a life of no work that's what i have right now it's not work this is drawing and having fun so keep that in mind and today don't waste your day do something good work on that portfolio 